Welcome to episode eight of the Creating Responsible Companies podcast. My name is Janet Craig, and I'm one of the co-founders of Destination Better. That's right, and I'm Barbara Anderson, the other founding partner of Destination Better, and we are the company who brings you the podcast, Creating Responsible Companies, and we're so excited to do so. We are, and I'm super excited today because this is my one of my absolute favorite, if Barbara will say, that it is my absolute favorite topic, but it is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I just love it. That's okay. right. So this is episode eight, how to communicate CSR to investors, owners, and shareholders. And this is the third part of a three-part series that we're doing on corporate communications and why corporate social responsibility, or CSR, is foundational to your content strategy and to your investor and investor relations strategy and how to include it with six components for success. So following our episode six, when we talked about internal communications and episode seven, where we talked about external communications, today we're going to talk about another type of external communication where we are looking at investors and owners. So as always, you can find show notes at destinationbetter.com slash eight, and we'll have a free resource for you there because that's always our promise. Um, it's not always easy. We work really hard that's on right. those to make it easy for you. So um, so today you can just sit back and listen because we've taken the notes for you. Yes, and we um, carved out this third in the series specific to investors because it's a unique way to communicate corporate social responsibility that most companies, I think, many, most overlook. And so I'm super excited and I'm so proud of Janet and the work that she's done in this space. And, and it's one that is near and dear to her house, heart. And so I know that the listeners are really going to enjoy this episode um, for those who have an opportunity to communicate with their owners. So I think it's going to be valuable for corporate social responsibility or CSR professionals. Also those in corporate communications and, um, and which who, who often have responsibility responsibilities for communicating with investors and it's really kind of a tricky space to include uh, to communicate to investors so this is a huge opportunity a real way to differentiate the company um, with those important stakeholders who own your company right so let's start with the definition uh, a definition of corporate social responsibility so we want to do this so that we're all talking kind of about the same thing about when we talk about communications and what we're talking about to investors, we want to make sure that we are all on the same page. So for the sake of this episode, we talk about the CSR as how a company manages its impact on the environment, as well as the people inside and outside of the company. So think in terms of employees, communities, governments, customers, suppliers, and owners, which we're going to talk about this time. And then the third component of this definition, in addition to the environment or the social components, is how a company governs these areas. And this includes a company's economic performance, which again is why we're here talking about investors. So we're going to go through each of these topics quickly, environment, social, and governance. And the first one being environment is fundamentally the company's energy, waste, water, and effluence. So uh, anything that the company produces as part of its operation. And on the economic side of things, and a lot of times we take um, the economic and the financial performance of the company, how the company makes money, um, it also kind of falls under that, that governance. Sometimes we hear ESG, and G is for the governance, and that is how are we managing our company to ensure long-term solid, sustainable financial performance. So how the company makes money, um, what kind of purchasing policies does it have? Are you including social and environmental factors in your decision making for the things, products and services that you're purchasing for your company? Where are you sourcing certain items? Are you ensuring that there's no child labor or human trafficking um, anywhere in your supply chain? And then also the ethics policies that help prevent corruption, 
um, and make sure that your company is competing fairly. That's right. So we've talked about environment, economic, or governance, Janet just covered. And then the last piece of the three parts of CSR is the social piece, which a lot of people think maybe that is the C what CSR is about. Um, so this is, again, how companies treat people inside and outside of the company. So think of topics like customer health and safety product ingredients and the transparency around those, labor practices, employment policies, um, safety, training, diversity, and discrimination of your employees. And then um, the tougher topics to talk about, things like preventing child labor or human trafficking in your supply chain, so critical. And then last, um, and perhaps the one most dear, near and dear to my heart, is how a company supports the communities in which it operates. So does it give back through um, financial giving or volunteer giving? Um, is it a good corporate citizen where it operates? So now we're gonna jump into the six components of um, how to communicate to your the owners of the company um, and so the first one is the audience and this one I'm gonna lean I'm gonna go through and lean on Janet to and interpret and we want to make sure that these terms while they may not be first-hand knowledge to everyone we want to make sure that they're understandable so the first is um, in terms of audience is institutional investors and Barbara's interpretation is, of this is companies who have large stakes in companies uh, and so Jen I'm gonna let you take it from there oh okay great <laughs> <laughs> so if you um, let's just say that listener has a 401k or an IRA or mm -hmm. some stock you know portfolios whatever um, you you may own some stock directly. I'm I'm not sure, but most likely you are um, you have portfolios in something like Schwab or Morgan Stanley mm -hmm. or, Ameriprise. or Ameriprise or something like that. Inside there, you'll see companies like BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, companies that own chunks of other companies, and the other companies they own are those companies that are traded on, like the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange or something like that. So these are companies that are, we call them publicly held because Barbara and I have a privately held company. That's right. Um, but for companies who have sold stock in their company to other owners, those companies need to answer questions to their for their investors. So that would be um, those institutional investors that own um, percentages of, of publicly held and publicly traded companies all around the world. Yeah, and one way to interpret this too, I think, is um, what's been surprising to me as Janet and I have talked with friends and family members about what we do. A few people have said, you know what? I've moved all of my money. I told them I didn't want money, any of my personal investments in weapons or in certain chemicals or or um, fossil fuels. Yeah, or mm -hmm. maybe um, ammunitions or mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Tobacco. Yeah, fires. and so people are pulling their money or moving, moving their, their money, money around. Me personally, I move some of mine to companies who have like more women in leadership or um, who manage, who are more responsible, really. That's the primary. And, and both Janet and I have done that and we've um, seen the financial benefits of that. So we encourage you to do that if you haven't already done it. But hopefully that helps to put in perspective as we talk about the audience being institutional investors. That's who those organizations are. The second is private investors. So you might hear like of a private equity company who buys an investment, maybe one private equity company or multiple. And I know when I was at Sabre, we had um, a couple different private equity firms. And so these are companies who often will take a public company who's like on a stock exchange and invest in it. And it provides the opportunity for the company to kind of close the kimono, if you will, but because if you're private, you don't have to report quite as many things. Yeah, so right? you're saying if a, a, a company, so it can work two ways, companies that are publicly held, um, a private equity firm can come in and buy that stock and make them private again. Mm -hmm. And then the private equity firm can hold a company for a while and they can make them public again if they would like. That's right. Yeah. So um, even companies who are privately held by these private equity companies, these large investors, they're eventually going to go public again. And so this is even more so more important to get things in order. And we'll talk about that. Um, and we want to make sure that the Creating Responsible Companies podcast is something that 
It's applicable to people who are in large companies, small companies, uh, mom and pop companies, if you will, like Janet and I. Although we're not a mom and pop, we're two moms. <laughs> a mom and mom. <laughs> a mom and mom company. <laughs> um, but this is something that when we talk about communicating to investors or owners, it's not just these mega companies, right? It's it's small companies like ours or companies who are startups. So um, there's uh, those are like basically your audience. Any kind of owners or like I even visited a distillery a few weeks ago and it's owned like by 20 some odd families. Those families are gonna wanna know how that business is run, right? And so this is a huge opportunity to communicate to them. And when we talk about startups, we're talking about those that are um, uh, that have a high potential value startup that are really looking for a private um, private investor money. And those private equity portfolios, you may have, I think that in the past, and and it could have been in some of the experiences that you've had in your career too, Barbara, is that you have a private equity partner come in and their reputation is like slash and burn. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Like cut cost. It it it. Whatever we can do, just cut cost. Get rid of people. You know, really like um, lean the lean the company and get it profitable again, and then spin it off, sell it to somebody else. And what we're seeing is this huge shift in in private equity um, funding, where they're looking at the things that we're going to talk about today that absolutely have an impact on the financials of those companies because some of the things really don't show up on the financials until you've kind of had an oopsie moment and we're going to talk about those today but that's why they're looking because some sometimes we don't see the things that they're looking for because they haven't shown up in revenues right now they will eventually so we need to make sure they're managed yeah one last thing on the private equity firms is we have colleagues who actually started one a firm who intentionally is trying not to do the slash and burn um, and uh, be a little kinder, gentler owners. And I will say that one uh, when I was in corporate America, one of the private equity firms that owned our company actually brought together all of the CSR professionals. And even if they didn't have one, they appointed someone in a company so that they could advance that. Be- and this was at least 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, and so they clearly saw the value of CSR back then and um, making sure that companies, it's fundamentally how well a company's managed. So Janet, let's go into the second component, which is what to. So what to communicate. You're probably going, Janet, what in the world would investors want to know besides what our revenue looks like, what our long-term strategy looks like? You know, we hear that all they care about is short term, um, you know, not they're not in it for the long term. Well, they are definitely in it for the long term. They wouldn't be talking to you. So what we have to first do is figure out on the what to communicate kind of umbrella is what to communicate. What are the social and environmental and those governance that how are your companies being managed? Those topics that are relevant for the industry that you're in. And just to kind of explain, Barbara and I work, and this is one of the problems with some of our CSR professionals that they have inside companies, is that people really don't understand what they do because we kind of work in this invisible space. It's easy to see financial statements where you can look at how much a company made, what their administrative costs were, what their revenues were, things like that. But there are things that happen before the rev- before the financial statements that are social and environmental factors that show up sometimes if something really awesome has happened or something not so great has happened. And those things show up in things like employee turnover, like higher administrative costs or um, legal fees because you've, I don't know, you had some bad environmental spill or something like that. So in order to really focus on what it is that the that is going to make the Im- biggest impact on investors and what the the topics that they can use to um, calculate what they feel like the value and the future value of your company is going to be. There are a couple of um, things to take in, into account. Number one is there are two kinds of impacts: things that happen very quickly and acute. <laughs> large event like uh, a big weather event or a snowstorm, a wildfire, something that is going to uh, not allow your business to continue its operations for a period of time. Or things that are chronic and progressive topics, things like a dripping water faucet, right? A little change in culture that 
um, that can just kind of degrade the company culture month after month after month and people start leaving and employee turnover increases. So those are those chronic and progressive things that we look for as well as those acute large events. So knowing that there's two kinds of events to, to look out for, the next thing that we that I would do if I were listening to this podcast is I would understand what industry that I'm in and I would get a cheat sheet. In, like ours. Like ours. So you can listen to episode five at destinationbetter.com slash five. It's called Better Company, CSR Made Easy in Three Steps. What we did was we took five questions that you can ask yourself if you've identified some con some topics five questions you can ask yourself to really determine is that topic relevant for your company and we didn't make these questions up these questions are used all over the world and they are also used by a really amazing organization called the sustainability accounting standards board so you can use our five topics mm -hmm. you can use our five questions to determine if a topic is something that you think you need to communicate and it includes things like does it have impact on revenues are our competitors doing it are our um, stakeholders do they want to know is there legislation is there a way for us to innovate around it um, those are the types of things if you still are a little lost I would encourage you to go to your web uh, search engine like Google and look up the SASB ticker lookup tool, S as in Sam, A, S as in Sam, B as in boy, for Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Just type in SASB ticker lookup tool. You can enter your company name if you're publicly held. If you're not publicly held, you can look up a company, just enter the name of a company, a competitor, someone who's similar to you. And SASB's um, SASB will return the topics that investors have deemed or their investor working groups um, and their other company working groups have deemed to, that may be relevant to your company. I know that was a really long answer on what to communicate, <laughs> but it's so important to get it right. Yeah. It's so important to get it right. And if I could add on that SASB lookup t ticker lookup tool, it's so helpful to, to look at the topics that investors see that are most important for the company because those are the ones that are going to have the biggest financial impact and it makes it really black and white and especially for csr professionals who might uh not have found the exact places that they should be focusing on it's it's a great resource and and i have to add because you might not add that you've actually got certification i do sasb has mm -hmm. a um has a credential called Fundamentals in Sustainability Accounting. And um, and so they have a, a two-part credential. I've got part one. Um, I don't have my second part yet, but I will have it soon, I hope. And um, But it's just it's such a great resource. Now, ultimately, it's up to you, company, and your internal stakeholders to determine if the topics that SASB has returned as maybe important to your company, it's up to the company to determine, yes, this is important to us or no, it's not. But that f those five questions, which is called the SASB five-factor test, if I promise you, if you get your internal stakeholders together, if you pull in your CFO, if you pull in your executive team and you go through this very easy exercise to ask the five questions, you will quickly determine the topics that are important for you. And we have a download for you, destinationbetter.com slash five. Go to that page, look at our show notes, go get the download and you'll be off to the races. So what that's what I would say is what to communicate. Okay, so that's, um, as we talked about the six different components of communicating with investors, shareholders, mm -hmm. owners, we covered number one was the audience. Mm -hmm. You just covered what to communicate. And then the third is why communicate, Janet? Why should we even communicate with investors? They're just investors. I know, right? <laughs> but they're so important. They're they also are. owners or potential owners. So um, a couple of things, we look at it this way. What triggers a communication? Is it uh, two-way two communication is it two-way communications is different for publicly held versus privately held company so you may have um, the law right if you're a publicly mm -hmm. traded company there's some law out there that says you need to put 
out an annual report. So there's information um, that you need to put in that annual report. That's a reason why you should communicate or you are communicating because you like legislatively or the law says that you have to. Um, number two, investors want to protect their investment dollars. They want to know mm -hmm. that they're getting a good return and they need to best predict their ROI because investors like me and Barbara in our investment portfolios, we want to know how those companies are performing. They're really good at sniffing out risk. That's right. That's right. So, um, so that's another reason why to communicate, why you should be communicating this. Um, also some, um, of the investor researchers, if you're not communicating your progress in some areas, they may use industry averages. And if they're using an industry average um, and you're performing in that topic area well above industry average, you may be missing out on some opportunities with investors. So we need to, um, to put to that To toot your there. own horn, right? You have to toot your mm -hmm. own horn. Um, so there is that. Also, um, by clearly communicating, it's a huge opportunity to foster relationships and really instill trust by being um, transparent. Um, we talk about annual reports and CSR reports and websites and social media, and those investors have teams of researchers that are out there looking for this information. And Barbara and I, when we were planning this um, episode, <laughs> we were laughing about the cartoon that I hope people remember called so, Family Circus. Uh -huh. And so in Family Circus, I remember I, I used to always think it was so funny. The mom would say, hey, son, I can't remember what his name is, Billy, I think. Yeah, um, could you go across the street and get a cup of sugar? And Billy's like, yeah, I can go across the street and get a cup of sugar. So that's in the first pane. And actually what happens was he went next door and he did a little research there. And then he went across the street and then he went across the street to somebody else's and then he <laughs> walks through somebody's backyard and he gets a little bit here and he's like, I was supposed to go over and just get a cup of sugar from the neighbor. And for some investor researchers, that is what it's like for them to go out and find information on your company. <clears throat> they're going to a website, they're going to in a report. Even when Barbara and I do research, we know how painful it is sometimes mm -hmm. because information spread all over the place. So if you can align and give your investors what they need very quickly, they're gonna be so happy with you and um, you're gonna just have a better relationship with them. Privately held companies face the exact same social and environmental impacts that publicly held companies do when they're in the same industry. The only difference is that we get to see what publicly held companies do. We don't That's always right. get to see. They what, have to open the kimono. They have to open the kimono. Mm -hmm. So if you're a privately held company, um, take a look at what those publicly held companies are doing and um, and make sure that you're communicating that as well to your private equity um, partners and always be transparent and accurate and relevant and authentic and all that good stuff. That's right. Okay, so that's um, the third component of communicating. So we're going to go into the fourth now, which is ways to communicate. And investors are unique in some ways in that they're looking for certain materials, as Janet said. But in the, the other way, they're looking for what you communicate to all of your stakeholders, right? To, um, to your communities, to your customers. So think about things that you have on your website and make them where maybe they aren't right prominent, but they could be a link for more information for for um, people who want more detail. So certainly in the annual report is one, um, and there's always, there's been discussion for years whether to have a separate annual report or in a CSR report or to combine them called integrated reporting. Um, so <clears throat> regardless of how you do it as a company, make that information available in your annual report, whether you're private or public. Um, and privately held companies can report as well, and that's just all part of being transparent. Um, use this uh, opportunity as a way to be proactive to educate your investors. So as you think about meetings with them, in, instead of waiting maybe for the investors to call, it's an opportunity to say, hey, this quarter, this is the call that we're going to have to share specific to our CSR with our investors. Um, and typically the CSR professional will work with the investor relations or IR expert um, and collaborate on that. But it's a huge opportunity to um, have the investor know that you are so transparent and that you're so confident in what you're doing. And even if you're not doing everything right, 
at least they admire that you are being honest about where you stand and um, it helps to foster that trust back and forth. Um, certainly, um, and that could even be a differentiator with you amongst your competition, um, those who are publicly held. Certainly investor presentations, and these are presentations that are typically given um, each um, month or each quarter whenever the company reports their earnings or annually. So embed the CSR topics in there. There's also um, uh, uh, CDP, if you want to talk a little bit about how investors use that, Janet. Sure. So CDP used to be mm-hmm. called the Carbon Disclosure Disclosure Project, um, but now it's called CDP because it involves um, carbon emissions and, and how companies are really um, – reporting their emissions and and reducing energy and moving to cleaner forms of energy um, if they are being asked to report on water and then their impacts on water around the world and their operations and then also on forestry. And so um, CDP kind of acts as a, um, a neutral third party and investors will ask CDP to ask companies on the investor's behalf to respond to CDP because investors know that companies that are managing their environmental and social impacts, especially some of the companies that are in CDP that um, are scored and in, in ma- maybe they've got an A or a B score, they clearly outperform their competitors who are not as sustainably focused as um, as that company is. Mm-hmm. And so CDP um, asks companies on behalf of investors to report, and then they take all that information that you um, that you put in your CDP report and they give it back to the investors. So it's really important to take a look at that. And if you're being asked to report, um, please report. It doesn't al- it's not always going to be perfect. And CDP is very nuanced. It's um, it gets, it's, it looks really hard. It's not the easiest thing. I love putting CDP <laughs> responses together <laughs> myself. Maybe one day we'll have a CDP class on creating yeah. responsible companies. But um, but investors are using that information and they're using it in their discount cash flow analysis. They're doing it. They're using it in their risk analysis. Super important that we're reporting there if you're asked. And then will you also talk about the opportunity for companies with um, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index? Sure. So there are other um, some other indices like Dow Jones Sustainability Index, which is DJSI. And there are some other um, indices that, that you can answer questions. Maybe, you, maybe your company is being invited to respond to DJSI to see if you can get in DJSI and be included in their portfolio of companies. But if you are, um, just the questions that DJSI is asking you, as is CDP too, they're really great inventory tools. Um, regardless mm-hmm. of you, if you score really high like on CDP. Like a self-inventory. It is, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. If, if not. And also to that end, um, when you have other requests from um, people that are doing business with you, you may get some of those um, types of questionnaires that you can use to do kind of a, a self inventory to find out what's what's important to you or not. But um, but yeah, so CDP and DJSI, it's always great if you look at the companies that are on DJSI and look at all the great things that they're doing. You can see that they're they're performing better. So of the six different components, we've gone through um, four. And the fifth one is, and it's always tricky with investors' communication, is like I think everybody kind of holds their breath a Mm -hmm. little bit when you're in the corporate world and you're communicating to investors or even company owners if you're a small company, right? Because Mm -hmm. they are the most important stakeholder, um, especially from a financial perspective. So what about component number five, Janet, words of caution? So on the words of caution for... Um, for when when we're talking about environment, social, and governance or CSR topics, I think you should treat those topics in that data just like you would a financial statement. You can get them audited. You can get them third party certified. Make sure that when you are um, putting all this information together, that it is accurate and it is relevant and it's complete and it's consistent and it's um, transparent and all those things. But you can words of caution. Um, spend the time and money to have it third-party verified. It will completely be worth your time. 
number one. Number two, stay on script, especially for investor relations. Mm -hmm. If you can go through and say, we went through our stakeholder analysis, we looked at SASB, we looked at these different things. These are the things that we know are having a major impact on our business, and this is where we're going to be focused. And if, you tie, if you're tying that back to business strategy, then you can stay in your lane. And also, super, super important, make sure that your executives are prepared mm-hmm. and make sure that you're going through your corporate communications team. Don't ever greenwash. So greenwashing is um, making it look like you're doing less bad. And that's just... <laughs> Yeah. Right, it's not good. Or not give, not providing all of the facts, so yeah. it looks good. It, so it yeah. looks good, and uh, and we've said this before in the other two episodes with the rapid transfer of information that happens now through social media and um, in avenues such as that, even um, through your employees in your company. The last thing that you want to do is put something out there that is like a half truth or something mm-hmm. that isn't great. Um, you always have an opportunity to correct course, but um, correct course internally <laughs> before before you have yeah. to fix a mistake externally. Um, always stay within your brand visually and with words, and um, and uh, you know take a look at those um, the resources that are out there um, for people that have um, have come before you and given you resources like CDP and the Global Reporting Initiative GRI and SASB. Um, take a look at them. You can always go and try to do this on your own, but um, that's another one of those words of caution. But there are awesome organizations out there that are doing a lot of this work, and they can give you some um, tools, and um, and they're there to help, as we are. That's right. So the sixth and final component of communicating with investors and with shareholders and company owners is looking at areas of opportunity. So we talked a little bit about how this can be a competitive differentiator, especially if you're the competitor companies to your company are not already integrating um, their relationships with their investors. And um, this is a huge opportunity to reinforce your company brand and your company reputation and these are such key stakeholders of of anyone really these are ones that you want to trust you know like and trust you um, and it can foster a connection to the company the better they understand your opportunity the investor understands your operation and the challenges you have and when we think about CSR we think about the weather challenges and, and so an investor sitting on Wall Street may not understand if there's a mudslide in California how it's going to disrupt your supply chain right and you're not going to get products where they need to be so <clears throat> Everything from that, we've seen um, walkouts of um, employees over 2019, um, companies um, where they uh, employees are standing up for social issues. And so it's important when investors see something like that, they understand maybe a little bit more about what happened or what the culture of that company is, which you've got some statistic about the the value of culture in a company you can it's actually a tangible thing right for especially it is. Yeah. i think that there was a um i believe that it came out um i thought it came out in a bank of america report where they um said that the culture of a company is about 52 percent of its value that was a recent report So that's a that's um, a big one. That's a big one. And one thing that we haven't specifically talked about in terms of owners, but so many companies have um, company stock purchase programs, right? You can buy your company stock at a discount, and so you want your employees who are also shareholders and financial shareholders in a company to understand um, everything about the company. And so that's a huge opportunity to instill that pride, and they can even become advocates for you as employees employees and as shareholders of a company. And I think the last and most important opportunity, area of opportunity is mo money, mo money, mo money. <laughs> <laughs> it, it could be a way to attract incremental investment, right? It is absolutely a way to attract um, incremental investment. And we see even with some of the companies that we work with that investor relations, now that they understand where they fit in underneath the umbrella <laughs> of corporate social responsibility or environment, social and government governance, ESG or sustainability. Once you start speaking their language and they get it, a lot of um, we we're starting to see um, investor relations departments say, "Wait, can we actually use this to go out and attract 
mm-hmm. additional investors that would have never looked at our company otherwise? Absolutely. And so instead of being on the wait for them to invest in our company, you can go out and find those those investors that you want as good partners in your company and owners in your company because they're interested and it matches the values of of what they are doing in 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 their own companies and the companies that they're invested in use it as a way to attract those investors well and and the leaders of the company know that cash flow is king in the operating company and the more investment you can Garner, boy, talk about the CSR professional being the hero in that yeah. case, right? And that's um, this field and this um, space of being a, a CSR or corporate citizenship or corporate responsibility, whatever you want to call it, sustain, corporate sustainability professional. We're every day almost having to justify our existence or to justify the value that he or she brings to the company and talk about bringing in incremental investment that is really huge and it's very practical i think that those relationships can be fostered because so, that, that cfo you want them to be your best friend right yeah yeah, yeah. yep you need the chief financial officer and everybody actually in the uh, c-suite to be on your team and to understand what you do as a CSR professional, and certainly this would be one that would raise their eyebrows in a good way. Yes, absolutely. So um, so uh, as we close, anything else that we left out, Janet? I know this is a topic that maybe doesn't um, resonate with everyone, but I think for those who understand this space and who see this as an opportunity, I think it's going to be gold for them. Yeah, I think so too. I, I think that um, that we we try to simplify it. Yeah. Um, sometimes it takes some longer conversations, but I also believe that we'll, with our show notes and with that episode five, Better Company CSR Made Easy in Three Steps um, download, that it might just um, help you, CSR professional, or someone who's in your company that could be in a private or publicly held company, um, to, to go to your CFO or go to your investor person and say, hey, I want to sit down and have a conversation with you about this. I think that, you know, we, we've, we've talked about things that our employees are interested in, but here's this thing <laughs> that says that, that we actually could perform better if we're addressing these things and we want to make a list of topics and use the five-factor test to figure out, are we missing any blind spots? Because that's when you have, you know, hiccup moments where, oh my gosh, we didn't see that coming. Well, if we sat down and and went through and made that list of topics and did the five-factor test and got everybody together in one room and spent a couple hours on it, then maybe it would um, pay off. But I also think it's going to help your relationship with people that you normally wouldn't think that you could have a really strong relationship with and um, use it to open doors and have conversations. That's what we're here for, to help you do a really great job and to make your job easier. Yeah, and, and as we've said before, the one of our favorite sayings is that companies are doing great things, they just aren't telling their story. And this certainly is one way, and I even think of small companies with maybe just a handful of employees or you know, a few dozen employees taking this information, doing the um, evaluation, like you said, looking at some of the um, tools like the Global Reporting Initiative or um, like in SASB, the lookup for what your industry should be focused on. And if you did that analysis, documented that, took it to the company owner and said, you know what, this is part of our story we're not telling. (laughs) You know, we should be telling this in um, when we do requests for proposals, we should have this on our website. So again, this is not just for large, huge mega corporations, but so we hope it's valuable. Um, to company leaders, to CSR professionals, and um, anyone that's in the corporate communication space, investor relations space, huge, huge opportunity, and I think it's a unique one. And so um, so let us know if it's something that you can apply to you on our multi-generationally friendly website, where you can drop us a note, drop us a voicemail, leave a voicemail. Um, we're also on social media on Facebook, where we also have a Facebook group. We'd love to get some, com- Janet would love love to get some conversation going <laughs> about this on our Facebook group. Absolutely. And um, we're on Instagram and LinkedIn. And um, for those who want to watch on YouTube, we have on YouTube. And we also have additional resources um, on our website, destinationbetter.com. And on LinkedIn, we have some other educational videos. Mm-hmm. So, And if you have a question uh, about the topic, yeah, go to destinationbetter.com, click on the Say Hello tab. And like Barbara said, there's a couple of different ways you can 
push the little button and leave us up to a three minute uh, um, message, a, a voice message. We don't want to call it a voicemail. But it's a voice message. That's right. <laughs> and then, or just type your um, type your uh, question in and, and send it to us, and we'll make sure that we get it get your question answered. Yep. And um, channels that we're on, if you um, subscribe to any, please uh, join us and subscribe and like us. We would love that and share this, especially this topic I think could be really valuable for people. Um, so we're on um, Apple, iTunes, we're on Google Play, Stitcher and Spotify and a number of other ones as well, but those are the, the primary ones. And so we thank you for joining us and we hope you join us next time.